Exactly. Light at the end of the tunnel. Okay. Um, so uh, welcome everyone and thanks for coming along, um, those in the room and those online. Um, it's my um, pleasure today to um, introduce uh, Dr. Alma Nurmidov. I'm sorry, Alma, I'm sure it's been a problem all your life. Um, Alma is, uh, is my friend and collaborator of a number of years now. Um, he did his uh, um, PhD in, um, in Sweden at the University of Lund um, on um, bacteriophages. He's a structural biologist at heart. Um, and then from there moved to um, um, Harvard Medical School in Boston, um, did some important um, initial drug discovery work there before moving to the Scripps Institute in California. And from Scripps, um, he has taken a position at the John Wayne um, Cancer Institute um, in California, um, where he leads their um, cancer drug discovery uh, effort. So, um, you know, my own association with Almar is he, I mean, he's an enormously creative scientist. Um, one of the issues that we faced was trying to figure out how to look at protein-protein interactions in living cells. And um, Almar came across our radar as someone who'd actually figured that out. And hopefully he's going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, but anyway, I think um, you're going to enjoy the talk and I'm very much looking forward to it. So Almar, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Dr. Friedlander, for uh, inviting me over. So um, I am Elmar Nurmamedov, and I will recap some of my um, recent um, you know, paths in science. So um, I have my PhD uh, from Lund University in Sweden. That is uh, 2007. That was a long time ago. And I did structural and functional studies of um, w 21 uh, basically X-ray crystallography. So essentially, um, upon finishing my PhD, I stayed at Lund University and did some more biophysical work on bacteriophages. And um, then I realized that I need, I need to move across the border to, um, to the United States. And uh, at Harvard Medical School, I ended up working with transcription factors and uh, full um, course uh, drug discovery program. Some of that study was successful, but mainly it was not successful due to um, many challenges in the transcription factor field. And um, then I decided to relocate myself to California. So at um, Scripps Research Institute, I worked with uh, Dr. Peter Vogt. Uh, so essentially, um, we worked with um, CMEC, beta catenin, and uh, early um, viral oncogenes. And this work was really pivotal in my career. Uh, I was able to discover small molecule modulators to beta catenin inhibitors and activators. So um, some of that work is currently in translation uh, for in the preclinical development, some of those inhibitors, but essentially I was able to carry out and inherit some of that research to where I am now. And um, so currently at John Wayne Cancer Institute, I am uh, leading the WINTH beta catenin um, cancer drug discovery program. And my work is split between, um, you know, WINTH beta catenin and uh, CHD1 as one of the um, drug discovery programs. Uh, at the same time, I'm overseeing as director of drug discovery, some of the other um, drug discovery programs within the Institute. What is Okay, so, so um, I want to start off with uh, my presentation is going to be um, layered in four different um, uh, sections. So I want to first talk about the CHD and the NERD complex, because this has been a very important part of my research in the past several years. And then I'm going to, I should probably stay here. So then I'm going to talk about the CHD4, um, uh, importance of CHD4 in glioblastoma. That's going to be about uh, nine slides. And then I will work through my, um, my way through our recent uh, CRISPR um, screen. This was one of the important uh, screens that uh, we have done uh, for CHD4. And then finally, I will touch upon the drug discovery program for direct medicinal chemistry program for CHD4. So I want to see this um, recent work on the CHD4 as a two parallel um, lines of work where we use the CRISPR genetic um, perturbation work and the medicinal chemistry work hand in hand um, really to, to for discovery of small molecular uh, leads for CHD4. Oh, 
Oops. So, so um, a CHD4 is very important for the brain cancer for glioblastoma, especially. So, um, as you know, um, brain cancers are really um, aggressive tumors, right? And uh, when you uh, follow the conventional course of therapy, what happens is that you hit um, uh, brain cancer with a tumor and essentially you will debulk it, leaving behind a few uh, cancer stem cells. And eventually they will come back uh, being more aggressive, being more resistant and will uh, recreate, repopulate the tumor and essentially leaving uh, without any further therapeutic options. So the new way we see brain cancers could be cured is by combination treatment. This is uh, where you can combine chemotherapies with um, conventional, uh, with new drugs like the CHD4 inhibitors and basically completely destroy the tumor and the um, resistant, uh, resistance uh, generating uh, stem cells and eventually uh, lead to a great um, therapeutic benefit for the patient. This is our big picture, our big rationale for, uh, for glioblastoma. So CHT4 has really become a popular um, protein in the past several years. I did a, um, a NIH uh, PubMed search just um, you know, a few months back and I found that the, uh, the words NERD and CHT4 have really um, you know, picked up in the past um, five to six years. And we, you can find uh, a few hundred up to a thousand hits in the past uh, you know, several years, uh, speaking to the importance of these uh, therapeutic targets. And CHT4 is one protein that's part of the nerd epigenetic complex. So essentially, currently you can see it um, really um, be a therapeutic target for a lot of cancers. So glioma is of course one of them, but other uh, important and um, uh, aggressive cancers like uh, triple negative breast cancer, like um, colon cancers, like endometrial cancers are um, real um, therapeutic targets um, for, will benefit from targeting the uh, CHT4. And uh, why is that uh, an ideal target? It's because the advantages are that uh, CHT4 drives resistant mechanism in these cancers, especially sits within the uh, cancer uh, stem cells. So it's overexpressed in many of these cancers, there is a gain of function and there is a lack of genetic mutations within the CHT4 gene itself. So that's uh, what makes it uh, an attractive target. And basically it's uh, hitting a CHT4 with small molecules synergizes uh, with chemotherapy. So of course there are challenges as well. You need to have a uh, larger of a th therapeutic window not to destroy a CHT4 function completely as it's important in, uh, in the brain development uh, as well, especially uh, in the pediatric setting. So um, CHT4 um, really has a main uh, three of, uh, types of uh, cellular engagement. So figure A here shows that, uh, you know, studies have shown that CHT4 will precipitate, co precipitate with the chromatin, suggesting that it has very important roles in uh, compacting the chromatin and making it available for transcriptional activity. B, um, studies show that um, uh, CHT4 and neurodepigenetic complex have importance in um, passaging the cells from a G1 to the SS phase, probably speaking to the, its importance in the cell cycling. And uh, very much important, especially for this study, is that CHT4 nerd complex has uh, importance in DNA damage response. So when you hit cancer cells with chemotherapy, you break DNA, right? especially with temozolomide, and then the cell will try to quickly fix that uh, broken DNA up. And this is where the CHT4 nerd complex will come into the play trying to repair. So imagine that if you inhibit the, um, the CHT4 complex itself, together with the chemotherapy, you get much uh, better clinical outcome. Recent um, studies, especially my colleagues at Harvard University have done this study. It's a snapshot from their Nature Genetics publication. They have done a scanning CRISPR screen um, trying to interrogate every target uh, of the neuroepigenetic complex. It's uh, 15 proteins. And they tried to see which one of them will give um, the maximum benefit, therapeutic benefit. Of course, their screen was done in the hematological um, you know, setting. But nevertheless, they found that um, in their assays, 
CHD4 and uh, RBBP4 are two proteins, are two components of the epigenetic complex that will give you therapeutic advantage. But of course, it has uh, um, setbacks onto the cell fitness as well. So um, another study showed that um, in terms of combination, um, DNA damaging agents will better synergize with, um, with um, inhibition of the NERD components. Again, speaking to the point that a combination therapy would really be a great clinical way to move forward with the future CHD4 uh, NERD complex inhibitors. Just to put things into the perspective into why we are doing this research at John Wayne Cancer Institute. So this is um, part of the, um, of the CRISPR study that my colleagues at Harvard University have done in their hematology setting. Basically, this is uh, the entire CHD4 protein. It's a large protein, 250 amino acids. So they have done a tiling or a scanning CRISPR screen. They try to have guides that will scan the entire length of CHD4 protein, introducing amino acid perturbations at every possible residue. And they try to mimic what will happen if a drug binds to that particular location. It's a great application of the CRISPR um, technology into small molecule drug discovery. So essentially they scored their um, findings in terms of therapeutic score and into the fitness of, uh, into the cell fitness, what happens in terms of the benefit versus in terms of killing healthy cells. And they found that pretty much the entire um, length of the CHD4 protein, perturbations on the entire length of the CHD4 protein have therapeutic advantages in their hemato hematology setting, except for this um, final um, area where um, basically uh, inhibiting it will not give you therapeutic advantage, but will, uh, will uh, uh, deteriorate um, cellular fitness. So essentially, uh, in terms of domains, the real interesting areas to inhibit would be the chromo domain and uh, this ATPase domain and this PhD domain. And we see that there is uh, a real low um, fitness for, for, for cell fitness and huge uh, therapeutic score. So CHD4 is, of course, and therefore important for glioblastoma. So from the very early days of embryonic development, NERD epigenetic complex is kicking into role. And um, there are three CHDs that really come in and out of the NERD epigenetic complex. So CHD3, CHD5, and CHD4. In the early days in the embryonic development, when the brain is just still um, going through phase transitions and when uh, the progenitor cells are in the proliferation mode and they populate the, uh, the, the brain and make um, subsections, CHD4 is very much important. And uh, once um, the brain matures, um, there is neuronal migration into areas of the brain, then uh, it's replaced by uh, CHD5. And then once the, the, uh, the person matures into a you know, teenage adulthood, and then basically um, the, the brain structures are already layered and with defined functions, that is replaced by CHD3. And they, this is basically the orchestration of the NERD epigenetic complex throughout um, throughout um, stages of development. So you can imagine that when cancer is, uh, when, when cancer kicks in, it wants to assume more of a, of, a, uh, of a cellular functions of a progenitor cell. So basically CHD4 starts to play a more predominant role and will uh, express in a way, uh, basically mimicking the early stages of brain development. And that's why CHD4 is important for, from the therapeutic perspective. So in terms of um, a therapeutic understanding, what exactly CHD4 and what exactly NERD epigenetic complex does in the context of chemotherapy, it has re been reduced to this mechanism of action. You have NERD epigenetic complex sitting on the promoters 
of, uh, of important genes, right? You hit them, you hit the cells with chemotherapy and what will happen is basically they will, will be broken and it will go in through DNA, um, a damage response. And basically um, it will go through MGMT when it's sensitive and basically it will go into RAT51 dependent DNA damage response. So, so CHT4 has huge association with RAT51 and uh, RAT51 uh, is shown to be as one of the key components of the neuroepigenetic complex when it comes to sensitivity to temozolomide to chemotherapy response. And this is published science. So um, a few more slides about the biology of the, um, of the importance of the CHT4 in the clinical setting. So um, our colleagues have compared uh, clinical patient samples from the public databases, uh, TCJ and Rembrandt, and they have compared cohorts of patients that have responded and not responded to chemotherapy. So essentially they have, um, they have, excuse me, they have compared non-tumor samples with the, uh, with the glioblastoma samples. And initially they found that the uh, glioblastoma samples have almost an order of magnitude of, uh, of, um, of two logs higher uh, expression of, uh, of CHD4. So um, CHD4 is one of the markers um, that really um, define glioblastoma, especially the aggressive uh, and resistant phase of glioblastoma. And both of these um, different um, settings and different uh, patient cohorts indicate uh, pretty much the same picture. And it translates into uh, patient survival as well. So you can see that um, CHD4 uh, low patients will have uh, pretty much a higher um, survival time and uh, CHD4 high expression patients will have several months of a less of a survival time. So everything in glioblastoma is measured by months, unfortunately. So this is a continuation of that study, and I'm not going to bore you with a lot of um, data from the literature. I'm just going to give you a little more background, and then we'll move into our own research. So in this study, basically, they have compared um, non-cancerous uh, human astrocytes with uh, glioma cells, and they have uh, inhibited um, CHT4 in both of the healthy, uh, healthy neuronal cell astrocytes and in the glioma cells. And basically their findings show that um, CHT4 inhibition will affect mostly um, glioma cells and not healthy, healthy astrocytes. Basically you will see that um, they're not impacted to the same level as glioma cells. And uh, here they show that basically the level of apoptosis is more in the glioma cells due to CHT4 uh, inhibition suggesting that there is a huge therapeutic benefit here to, um, to inhibition of CHD4 in the context of glioblastoma. So um, this is one of the um, uh, final slides here suggesting that uh, when you inhibit CHD4 in the glioma uh, setting, the uh, cells will basically try to repair it, but the cells with CHD4 impairment will take a longer time to repair DNA. And this finding will actually will be later very good benchmark on comparison to our therapeutic studies. So um, basically this is, the, um, uh, one of the final slides here suggesting that um, when you compare responding and uh, non-responding uh, brain cancer patient samples, so mainly the non-responders have a high CHD4 levels. And the, this is a li lineup of various components of the neuroepigenetic complex, CHD4s, HDACs, RBBP4, and the other components where all of the other components, the difference between responding and non-responding patients is not that great. You will see that um, there is uh, a significant increase in the expression levels of CHD4 in these, uh, these non-responding patients. Again, suggesting that CHD4 is important. 
I'm going to skip this slide basically mentioning here that um, in the um, CHT4 is essentially very important in the metastasis free survival. So essentially everything that's related to metastasis and to um, to um, uh, drug resistance, CHT4 will be uh, will have an important um, impact on it. So um, this is our data from our lab. Basically, what we have done is basically we have taken a, a, a number of glioma cells, glioma cell lines, and we have exposed them to timozolomide at a certain concentration. I believe 30 micromolar here, and we gave them a, a nice uh, time course. And what we find is that upon that TMZ exposure, the cells will have an increase it um, levels of CHT4 expression. This is one of the early indicators from our lab suggesting that CHT4 will respond very quickly to chemotherapy. And we can see this across many cells, many different cell types, except some cells will have up and down effect, but essentially this upper increased effect will be consistent across uh, many uh, different glioblastoma types. So this is this is protein expression, right? This is protein expression, what's the block, so, whole cell analysis. Uh, so, so how do you know that it's not a problem of stability? And that maybe what happened is that when you treated your CHD4, it becomes more stable, but there is any transcription of change. Right, this is a whole cell Western blood analysis. Perhaps there is a biophysical stability of CHT4 and I have a separate slide for that as well. But this is basically the entire uh, level of CHT4. It's uh, done in denaturing conditions. So if there was a stabilization of CHT4, perhaps that would not reflect into these denaturing conditions. So I like to assume that this is the total amount of CHT4 that's being expressed. Um, yeah, but if you give the drug to the cell, right, and the consequence of giving the drug is that the, mess the, the protein stabilizes or the messenger stabilizes, mm -hmm. then you will get more protein in your protein lysis anyway. Right. So um, we haven't looked into the genetic background of these cells, how that relates into the CHT4 expression, but nevertheless, there's a gain of function of CHT4 on the expression level. So the abundance of CHT4 is one of the drivers of their resistance to chemotherapy. And if you um, keep treating these cells with, uh, with chemotherapy, eventually they will, come, they will become 10, 20 fold more resistant to temozolomide. And essentially, at some point, they will stop responding to TMZ altogether. So um, this is one of our, um, you know, stepping stone um, uh, data suggesting that, you know, if you take the same uh, glioma cells and if you inhibit, for example, uh, by CRISPR, CHD4, and other components of, of the neuroepigenetic complex versus compare them to a dummy control. So the, the ones that have CHD4 uh, knockout or, um, or disruption will be more sensitive to TMZ. So suggesting that um, CHD4 um, function, genetic function is important for the response of these cells to TMZ. So this was one of the pieces of data that were, that went into one of the, our foundational work with the CRISPR for CHD4. So um, now I will switch to our um, data for with the uh, tile and CRISPR screen. So essentially uh, this screen is uh, our stepping stone to our, um, uh, to our medicinal chemistry and discovery of our small molecular probes directly targeting CHD4. And um, we assume a certain line of events during our uh, CRISPR study. So essentially, we want this um, tile and CRISPR screen be a foundation, be a guiding principle for us to find small molecular drugs to CHD4. So part of that work is basically tile and CRISPR screen, and I will talk more about this. And after we identify the, um, the areas, the sections of CHD4 that are important for drug screen, we will do in silico drug screening using the crystal structure of CHD4. And that was a really important component. And once we identify the small molecules, then basically we will go into a small um, drug prioritization mechanism of action studies, basically, um, throwing in and employing various um, reporter assays, various biological assays, so we better understand 
uh, which drugs are better than the others. And then the mechanism of action studies. And eventually we want to translate our findings into the patient arena. Of course, we uh, at the Institute where we don't operate like a pharmaceutical company, we will not discover a really a phase one clinical drug here, but essentially we will come up with a, with a molecule that has a potential to translate and go across the border. And our um, clinical samples and our uh, bioinformatical wealth of information behind every patient sample will be important bioinformatical tool for us to really use for that translation. So um, the CRISPR screen has designed in uh, two pieces. Basically, um, we take on, on one side, um, we call it the forward screen. The forward screen is basically, we start with TMZ sensitive parental cells. And we know these cells are responding to TMZ for a, certain, uh, for a certain time. And on the reverse screen, this is the second side of the pillar of the screen, we have taken TMZ, um, excuse me, resistant um, glioma cells. This is resistant. Basically, we have taken two buckets of cells, the same cells, the sensitive version and the resistant version of the same cells, expose them to the same CRISPR scanning uh, um, strategy. And basically we have compared what happens to those cells if we treat them with uh, DMSO and TMZ in those dependent manner. So we, what we wanna see is basically, we wanna depletion or enrichment of certain guide of certain basically types of mutation in those cells. And eventually we wanna understand and answer the questions, what prevents resistance really in these cells? And in this case, we want to understand what will induce sensitivity in these cells. And are our findings from the forward screen and reverse screen comparable to each other? Are the same portions of CH24 protein responsible for both of these cases? And if we find one drug, will that one drug be important to prevent resistance and also to induce sensitivity in the case of already resistant cancers? So um, again, this is the logistics of the, of the screen. So this, you have the CHD4 protein gene, excuse me. And we have guides that will perturb every amino acid. So basically it's a, it's a pooled screen with thousand different guides and there is enough redundancy there to account for, um, you know, for statistical significance. And then you put those uh, in a virus and then basically you have Cas9 expressing equivalence of your glioma cells, send forward screen, reverse screen. And then you basically go through the, um, the, 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 the selection process and then you uh, will do the convolution. You will bioinformatically collect and count your guides and then do a lot of rigorous bioinformatics study, which is, uh, we have great partners really to cover that in. This is another, um, um, detailed look into the, uh, the process. We start with 300 micromolars of TMZ and go up to almost two millimolar. And we can see that um, a lot of great um, perturbations. So it, there is a selective, uh, this is enough of a selective pressure that will uh, have both the sensitive and the resistant glioma cells respond. How, how, how many different so we have a coverage of um, around a thousand different guides. So this is a pool screen, though. It all comes in one, like, you know, nice pool. And uh, in terms of CRISPR, this is actually a small library. If you have to do a whole genome library, you would go anywhere above 30,000 different, um, you know, uh, viruses. So that the complexity would be that high. In this case, the complexity is just thousand, but you want to make sure that every virus infects just one cell. So there is like you know one guide per cell principle, and that's why you have to just calculate the MOI accordingly, but still have enough cells infected by the same type of virus so that for statistical significance of that. So this is uh, basically our sensitive skills and we wanna uh, understand what guides prevent resistance in the first place before resistant, resistance happens. And uh, in, 
In the, in the reverse screen, basically, where we use the resistant cells to start with, we want to understand what guides, what kind of perturbations in CHT4 gene and therefore CHT4 protein will, uh, will, can be used to, um, to resensitize these uh, resistant cancers. So um, I have, uh, this is a work in progress. So both of the sides of the study the CRISPR side and uh, the medicinal chemistry side, both of those sides are in progress. So, and you will realize that there are gaps in both sides. So, and uh, I hope the study will, will, um, will uh, wind down in, in about like one year. And we have a number of collaborators bringing, plugging in at various points of this study. But nevertheless, I have some early data that I'm really excited about. This is our um, first data from from the CRISPR bioinformatics. And we have here basically a heat map for, um, for the um, forward screen and the reverse screen. So basically we just wanna see from a very general perspective, what is the type of changes that occurred during the screen? So um, on the forward screen side, you will see that there are blue sections, which is basically depletions of guides, certain types of guides got so much bad to the detrimental to the cells that they just fell out. And you will see that a lot of, there's a lot of enrichment here. Uh, these are the red sections. So on the um, reverse screen side now, uh, the, the green box here, you can see that there is a lot more uh, depletion of the guides. And there is um, also enrichment, especially in certain areas, there's a lot of enrichment, but it looks like um, the, um, the screen is driven by enrichment of first uh, of, of, uh, of certain guides in the first place. So enrichment of these guides will drive the resistance uh, of uh, in the setting. Am I making sense? They have questions. What's the y axis? Excuse me. So on the y-axis um, is a dendrogram. This is a statistical, basically, the linkage between the sections um, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, screen. Basically, I would prefer that, you know, they would, uh, in each column, they would basically go from the lowest to the highest. But the way these dendrograms work is by uh, statistical linkage to the um, areas of enrichment. But nevertheless, the, the message... I like to take from this heat uh, map is basically an overview of the depletion versus enrichment of guides in the screen. And we can see that there is a really um, a differential type of behavior in both screens. So it looks like the reverse screen, this one is driven more by, um, you know, by uh, enrichment and there is more depletion of guides as compared to the, um, to the forward screen. So this is um, certain um, doses um, of, of TMZ, and we wanna see what happens to the travel of certain guides uh, within the forward screen. This is the screen started with the sensitive cells. So essentially you will see that as you ramp up the concentration, uh, the TMZ concentration, you will see that there is a certain amount of guides that will fall out and there is certain enrichment. And as you ramp up the TMZ concentration here, you will see that basically there is more guides falling out, being depleted, more enrichment. And essentially at a certain point, there is uh, the amount of guides falling out will be much less. And then basically whatever has been enriched is already being stabilized. So you're kind of pushing the selection pressure towards enriching certain guides. And this is basically, um, you know, a, time dependent um, travel of those um, selected guides. So, um, and now uh, when you convert all of this bioinformatically and wanna make sense of this in terms of medicinal chemistry, now the question becomes, what is more important really for you here? Um, is it the uh, depleted guides or is it the enriched guides? Because, um, and that is one thing that's still open to debate in the bioinformatics field, especially scanning CRISPR bioinformatics. So I have been advised that the enrichments of guides is more therapeutically relevant, more translatable to discover small molecules because depletions can occur 
at uh, depletions could it can be led by uh, disruptions of the gene at any specific locations of the gene. And you will not know what caused uh, that depletion. It could be a large frame shift mutation very early on in the gene point that, that led to that depletion. But uh, enrichments are more position dependent mutations that will better represent perturbations, structural perturbations in the CHT4 protein and are better translatable to, to discover small molecular probes. How does that relate to the clinical dose of PFC? So um, clinically, this is um, 450 microliters is a very low dose. It's very low dose. This is, so, um, you know, I my belief is that when you, first treat a brain cancer patient with TMZ, that would be equivalence of millimolars. And this is much lower than that. So when you look at the um, uh, reverse screen, we have used a different um, dose structure. We started with 800 and we went up to a three millimolar of, uh, of uh, TMZ. So a, a starting point clinical dose would be just around here. So we again saw that um, you know there is um, there is um, there is depletion of guides starting with more depletion and then getting less and then basically it's more uh, enrichment uh, based process. So again, um, basically this is just a starting point for us to prioritize and see what really happened in those screens. And again, I think uh, I, I've been advised that uh, enrichments of guides will better represent, these guides will better represent and will be better translated for, for our um, medicinal chemistry discovery. What we have done from here is uh, we have taken some of these guides from this forward screen and the reverse screen and identified common guides that were, uh, that really got depleted and enriched in both screens. And uh, we have come up with a panel of these selected guides. And I'm still trying to make sense of this data. This is data from past week. And um, it's interesting. Basically the red lines represent here the, uh, the forward screen and the um, green line represents the reverse screen. So I have here, these red boxes. So red boxes in my primitive understanding are the guides that are important uh, in, the, uh, in the forward screen and otherwise not that important in the reverse screen. So basically you can see that it went up here. It got enriched, but not impacted in the reverse screen. It got impacted in certain way down and up, not important in the reverse screen and vice versa. It got depleted here, but not impacted here. So there are three of guides is this blue boxes. These are the guides that are important in both the, uh, the forward screen and the reverse screen for take just like a few examples here. Um, for example, this one or this one, you will see that it went up just quite a bit here, but then it got significantly up uh, in, the, um, in the reverse screen. Take, for example, this same pattern, uh, this would be same pattern. So perhaps these are the type of guides that we should really take into account for translating our findings into medicinal chemistry um, efforts. And then I have um, a, a panel of guides, these purple boxes, where basically um, it was not that important in the, in the forward screen, but was very important in the reverse screen, like in this case, and um, or um, both of them were impacted in equal manner. And then there are type of guides that we just don't understand. We, we just don't know what it really uh, means for us. So um, in bioinformatics, you have to make certain assumptions. And currently we are working through several assumptions. Our strongest assumption led us to this selection of guides. And um, still in the progress, but we want to do what we want to do from here is take all of these guys and reduce all of those to the coordinates of the CHT4 protein. What happens? And we want to see which parts of the CHT4 protein will be, um, you know, will be impacted by these perturbations. That is a heavy bioinformatics um, lifting. Uh, so that is in the progress. But what I have done primitively is basically put arrows 
and show you which domains are really impacted by those CH3-4s. And then I have a quick question. Is sure. It, is there a recent structure of CH4-1? Or That's a very good question. I'll come to it. I have a slide for that. But I can tell you that um, there are parts of this protein being crystallized. So we have crystal structures for PHD, chroma domain, and ATPase, but not for the entire protein in one setting. But we can see that most of our um, these guides fall onto these regions. So we can see that PHD4 disruption with PHD4 chroma domain is very therapeutically relevant, as if um, you don't want to uh, basically, you want to mess with these areas. Really, you want to have a molecule, a small molecule, a drug molecule that will bind to these regions and mimic the impact of these guides. That will be translatable. We know that ATPase is important therapeutically because it's the uh, catalytic function of the CHT4 protein. It has the ATPase function because when it repairs uh, broken DNA, that kicks in, but we know that it's also important for the healthy homeostasis of this protein. So you really don't want a molecule binding here and having a selective ATPase inhibitor would be challenging in the first place. We don't want that. So, but then we have a little knowledge about this uh, C tail of this protein and we just, and it looks like it's therapeutically inert. So um, this work is still in the progress, right? So um, bioinformatics is a big part of it. And I will acknowledge some of these guys who made effort here. And now we wanna um, segue to small molecule drug discovery here. Knowing that um, the chromo and PhD domains uh, are important, we made a selection that chromo domain would be actually a good starting point for drug discovery. So um, this is, um, this, the structural biology field really is accelerating the past few months, right? AI is driving, driving this field. So this is a structure prediction by AlphaFold. So, um, and you can see here that um, I just overlaid the, the domains of CHD4 proteins. So the parts of the protein that correspond to PHD and chroma domains are very well structured. And you will see that structure here. So the N-terminus, C-terminus are intrinsically disordered. Even a uh, alpha fold cannot predict it. So, but I'm sure alpha fold is changing the game altogether. And um, that's why I think that X-ray crystallography per se as a career track may be a little outdated. So uh, what one needs to be careful. And then what we did is basically then we relied on this principle and then we took the, um, the published X-ray structure of the chromo domain for our small molecule drug discovery. This is the um, um, chromo domain of CHD4 in the protein database. It's publicly available knowledge. What you can do is extract the structure of the CHD4 uh, of, the, of this one and then do whatever you want programmatically with it. So what we have done, we have done, we have this AI-based drug discovery in silico drug discovery method. You can scan the surface of the protein structure for, for basically uh, hot and cold sides. So, and you can scan the surface with small molecules, <laughs> with uh, amino acids, whatever your uh, protocol um, wants to do. So the blue dots here represent cold dots, cold areas, no excess energy of binding. A small molecule cannot bind there. Red areas, like in this case, are um, allosteric sites with excess energy, with enough energy for a small molecule to bind. And these are several variations, viewpoints of the same protein. Essentially, this gives us enough of um, you know, starting point. So for example, here, we can zoom into this patch and then basically dock an entire library of small molecules to that particular area to identify um, heat compounds. And that's exactly what we have done. So that area also matches with the result that you found from your guide RNA uh, experiments? The guide RNA work uh, at this point of work gives us just the idea that chromodomain is important. 
but we don't have right now enough resolution to tell which parts of the chroma domain will be important, but that's going to be very important. And, you know, there's going to be a... Right, and that's the idea, that's where we're going. The bioinformatics is just something that we don't carry in our lab, so we have to rely on our collaborators. That's why it's uh, still in the process. So what we have done is basically we have um, scanned the surface with our, um, uh, with our AI technology. We have found quite a bit of allosteric sites. So all these red spots are allosteric sites, potentially, you know, amenable for a small molecule to bind. And then we have used each of those um, six sites and we have docked an NCI library around 175,000 compounds, big enough to represent a lot of chemical space. So we have just 75 candidates passing through a lot of filters. And we have then uh, a number of reporter assays that will narrow down these 75 candidates to, to just 12 um, candidates, 12 small molecules we can really work in our lab, in our assays. And um, basically uh, we have out of this 12 now are zooming into just uh, three molecules that I will mention to you. I hope I will not run out of time. So um, in our lab, we're really keen on cellular target engagement. I think Rob will, um, will can comment on, the, on this more, but essentially what we're trying to do is we are trying to look into thermal melting profile of any given target protein in the context of the cell without even taking it out. So the conventional target engagement, cellular target engagement works a very, uh, in a very simple, elegant way. You will expose your cells to a temperature gradient. The protein, everything will, will melt differentially and you can detect your target of interest with antibodies and see whether or not uh, if it gets stabilized by your small molecular ligands in a, in a dose or temperature dependent manner. So this is already published and there are some pioneers in that study. So we have applied this tool to CHD4 protein. It's a robust protein that melts early on. It's like a gentle giant. You reach a temperature around 40 degrees, basically it's already gone. So it becomes basically insoluble and gets stuck in the well. So this is soluble CHT4 around the temperature of <clears throat> 39, around 41, the protein melts. So this gives us um, a method for testing our small molecular probes we have discovered um, that I showed you previously. And we have done that. This is what our uh, first compound, CH41. I'm not gonna show you the structures because my technology transfer office uh, is not, um, you know, uh, giving me enough uh, privileges for that. So CHD, CH41 is our first molecule that um, binds to um, CHD4 protein. And you can see that when you expose cells to this drug, it's not clearly visible here, but there is a stabilization of CHD4. There is intensity of the band will increase in dose-dependent manner. So um, this is another drug, CH61, which also impacts the um, stabilization, biophysical stabilization of CHD4 in those dependent manner. So essentially, this is one of the um, early assays that we use in our lab to really verify and test these molecules in the cellular context. So um, compound 81 was one of the great compounds, but essentially we did not see it impact um, cellular, uh, in the cellular context, impact CHD4 protein. And this is one of the positive controls. Uh, I believe it's um, a nucleotide analog, a substrate for DNA damage response. So basically we can see that also stabilizes CHD4 in those dependent manners. And you can really, um, this is one of the primitive ways you can show this data. I like to show this data is more kind of, you know, in a curve manner, but um, I just did not have enough of an input here. But this is the idea behind cell target engagement. What IC50s you have for these drugs? IC50s of these drugs, like in this case, in this case, it would be EC50 of target engagement. I would say for this one, it's just below one micromolar. 
for this one is just above it. And it's a micromolar level drugs that are good starting point for a drug discovery effort. And then what we have done is, of course, we don't want to rely on one principle for drug discovery, right? We, you don't want to re rely on one method. So we have expressed purified chromo domain of CHD4 in insect cells. We basically ran an MST experiment, micro scale thermophoresis. It's a way to measure interaction of a protein with a ligand, um, you know, in a more controlled artificial setting. And uh, what we have done is basically we have measured and uh, we can uh, calculate uh, the, uh, the affinity of binding. It looks like CH81, the compound that was did not do great here, looks like it binds with uh, an affinity around 50, 84 nanomolar. So it's pretty good binder. Compound 41, which is our one of our best compounds currently, binds with a KD around um, 490 nanomolar, which is an okay compound. And compound 43 is um, a good binder, but it turns out to be an inert compound, or at least biologically and biophysically, we don't get a measurable effect. And compound 61 is our last one, which is a, one of the weakest binders, but still a good uh, compound biologically uh, driving uh, the phenotype that we are after. So as you know, these compounds, um, um, they have various type strengths of um, binding to CH4, and um, they are all chemically distinct from each other. But nevertheless, they drive, um, you know, um, the, the phenotype to CHT4 that we're after. So all of them are potentially good starting points for a drug discovery program if this translates to the industry one day. Are they all uh, small drugs or are, are some of these big drugs? All of them are small drugs. So we're looking at drugs below molecular uh, weight around uh, 550. So um, because we don't have a crystal structure of chromodomain with the small molecule, my first thinking is, you know, does it really bind to CHD4 in the first place? We, we have initiated a crystallography study with, um, with chromodomain and our small molecule that's going, but you know, you, these days AI is really strong. So there are web-based tools for predictions. So this is our, one of our compounds predicted to bind to an allosteric crevice, uh, you know, um, between the motifs of this chromodomain. So we know, we know that our best compound, um, CH41, maps to chromodomain of CHD4, but we don't have enough of a electronic, uh, you know, resolution the, uh, to really pinpoint to what residues are gonna be important. If we wanna engineer uh, the small molecule for, for, for better efficacy, for better binding, we have to know that and we have to have that resolution going. But nevertheless, this is a good um, uh, stepping stone. So uh, I'm gonna quickly go through these slides. Basically, our idea is to make sure that our small molecules will synergize with chemotherapy, right? Eventually, if this translates into the, into the industry, into the clinic, we want to see a combination study really um, benefiting uh, patients from existing chemotherapies. So this is a combination matrix showing um, yeah, that compound 41 in combination with TMZ has a good um, synergy. Not good, but acceptable synergy. It could be better than this. Compound 61, which was a, a weak binder in the MST measurements, also has acceptable synergy. And this synergy measures cell viability of a single agent versus their combinations at various doses. Interestingly, compound 43, which um, was a good binder in the MST measurements, did not have any um, measurable or a good starting point for a combination. So that's why we need to look at these molecules in, at different levels by potency of engagement by IC50, by combination potential, and have biological readouts as well. 
and compound 81, which was a weak binder and turned out actually not um, having a combination with TMZ. So um, from here, uh, we are really trying to understand the mechanism of action of these drugs. So of course, we, when we started the study, there was a cell line that went into CRISPR studies, right? Reverse screen, forward screen. So ideally we wanna see those cells going into future mouse work. And we wanna test um, you know, our small molecules on these cells and that is still in the process. But essentially one way we're looking at it is whether or not these small molecules will kill glioma stem cells. And this is um, a, a data from our collaborators uh, in Wisconsin. Basically um, they have tested all of our, um, an expanded list of our compounds on their cells. And they found that the compound 41, which was our best compound, here it's labeled as 1,4, but it's 41, has a really um, good IC50 on these cells. And compound 61 has an acceptable IC50. This is um, compound 41 having uh, an IC50 around, um, you name it, uh, is that the five nanomolar, 50 nanomolar? And uh, compound 61 having uh, just around uh, one micromolar. So, um, and for these many reasons, compound 41 is going more into, uh, you know, is our favorite compound that we want to push into more into translation, uh, trans translational work. So um, our collaborators who are doing the DNA damage response, uh, collaborators at the University of Austin are looking at various type of chemotherapies here as well. They are testing uh, TMZ and also PARP inhibitors. And this is their, their data um, with PARP inhibitors. Basically, um, they try to look at combinations of our um, favorite drugs, selected drugs, as single agents and with combination with uh, PARP inhibitors. And it looks like uh, compound 41, which is now our favorite, has a real um, promising combination index so um, compound 61 has a less of a promising profile and then compound um, 81 looks also having like um, an acceptable um, combination profile really with compound 41 driving our, um, our program forward. Compound 41 is our favorite. So um, I'm two minutes away from- I, I, I need something here. I don't know, where, where are you measuring? Where are you measuring? You know, uh, so that? So this is a percent, uh, basically, um, this is, this is uh, I believe, cell viability. But the way it's um, percent confluence, good point, good catch. So I need to look into, uh, into how this translates into cell viability. My belief is that in these assays, you want to look for cell viability. Yes. Thanks for that. So, um, and our collaborators now are really try to tie into the mechanism of action of this drug. Remember in the beginning, I mentioned that CHT4 really um, works together with RAT51 to salvage those DNA breakage sites, right? So really now it's time to link up all of our findings back to the known mechanism of action. I'm sure we're blinded by what's known, but at least this is our path forward. So here we have, the sensitive um, glioma cells that we used on our CRISPR screen. And we used, uh, they used also uh, resistant, TMZ resistant glioma cells, and they compared various agents. Basically, um, they, they did, I believe, chip PCR. You immunoprecipitate uh, CHD4, and then you do PCR to see whether or not it binds to promoters of, spe of specific genes. And they found that RAT51 promoter is more impacted. So CHD4, um, C, uh, so compound 41 here somehow connects and, um, uh, and impacts binding of CHD4 with RAD51 promoter, more so in the resistance cells, really um, driving our understanding of what this small molecule is doing in these cancer cells. The impact of the other two molecules, 61 and 81, is there. It's more than the, um, the, the, the background control, the MSO control, but it's not as pronounced as compound 41. I'm going to go a few minutes 
above the allocated time point. I hope you can forgive me for that. So, um, but then, you know, they are doing these assays uh, with RAT51 um, mechanism of action, not only in two dimensional format, but they're growing neurospheres, which will better represent the tumor morphology. So essentially um, these neurospheres that are growing from our cells that were used in the CRISPR screen. And they treated that, those cells with uh, various compounds. You can see that compound 41, 61, 81, all of them will deplete um, CHT4 protein. Basically, it's a, it's a Western blood analysis of a whole cell lysate. And uh, RAT51 gets really impacted by compound 41. So, uh, and then compound 81 looks like a completely opposite effect. Looks like there are distinct mechanisms of action with these small molecules that we have discovered. And then they have a way to understand and measure um, the, um, the, the uh, how these molecules will impact the DNA damage response. This is the way the assay was built. They have basically a FOC1 enzyme nuclease that will cut into certain places. And basically that will uh, translate into the amount of fluorescent signal in these cells. And they are using ATM inhibitors as their positive control. Basically, um, this is how the assay is set up. And um, so in this assay, we figure that when you treat these cells with a, with a positive control, control uh, compound 41, 61, 81, we have our compound 41 score as much as ATM inhibitors, suggesting that they inhibit DNA damage machinery to the, to the same level as some of the um, standard controls out there. Compound 61 is not that great. Compound 81 still has a potential. And then um, CHT4 inhibitors are not impacting the recruitment of the DNA damage response to these, uh, of, the, of the DNA damage response machinery to the damage sites. There are two components to DNA damage response. First is recruitment of the protein complex to the dam damage, broken DNA damage sites. And the second component is the functionality of that, of that protein complex. Looks like recruitment of the NERD complex to the DNA damage sites is not impacted. So we can see that um, basically we are, these are DNA damage sites, basically get the same response, same response, same response. So recruitment, not a problem. What really happens is at the um, retention of these, uh, of the retention time of the DNA damage response complex at the damage units. It looks like just a quick snapshot. Compound 41 will delay the function of the DNA damage response machinery at the damage sites. So the machinery arrives there to DNA damage sites and basically gets stuck there. Its function is delayed. It's basically impaired. And this is that time course analysis. Basically, uh, this is a damage point and basically the fluorescent signal will improve, but with compound 41, that will take a longer time suggesting that these damaged cells really are struggling to come back to life. And compound one is actually a potential therapeutic. Quickly about, um, about the selectivity of compound 41 here. So basically um, you have now two types of cells, the wild type cells and the cells with CHD4 knockout and it turns out the uh, cells with CHT4 knockout are not responding to compound 41, suggesting that there is a target dependent selectivity. So we have now discovered and are zoomed into these four compounds, CH41, 61, 81. We understand that, you know, they do not necessarily mimic the, the, our findings from the CRISPR screen, but nevertheless, they have um, distinct mechanisms of action. And I think this is very much expected, expected. So in terms of recruitment to DNA damage sites, none of them impact. So in terms of retention of, at the DNA damage site, compound 61 is really uh, strong. Loss of transcriptional silencing of the DNA um, site breakage sites, 
So both compounds are important. One compound is important at the reduced HR efficiency, and um, both compounds 41 and 61 have impact on reduced proliferation of these cells. I'm going to stop here, um, basically um, telling you what's going to happen after um, in the future. Basically, we are, we are right now clearing this uh, scanning tile and CRISPR screen. We have done a big chunk of the in silico screening, and that led us to this uh, compound identification, early uh, hit uh, discovery. Right now, most of our efforts are in the arena of the mechanism of action. We're tr trying to do combinations, RNA-seq, attack-seq, um, you know, facts analysis to really understand what happens to the healthy cells versus the cancer cells, sensitive cancer cells versus resistant cells, various modalities. We're trying to really uh, flush out the mechanism of action. And really, my main interest is to translate this work into early preclinical work, meaning we're not going to treat patients. We can't do it, but at least we have enough of a bioinformatic patient, bioinformatic data to support our hypothesis. And bioinformatically, that's very much possible. I would like to thank um, our um, institute and hospital leadership for really um, funding this work, giving the opportunity to drive it forward, and giving me the opportunity to shape that work according uh, to my knowledge of the field. Our, um, you know, lab um, leadership, Santos Kayseri, and our um, lab members, Mike, Natsuka, Anton, of course, our collaborators at various universities, University of Austin, uh, doing our work, um, helping us with the DNA damage response analysis. Um, Harvard University Lab working with us on the, the bioinformatics component, because this is heavily bioinformatically um, important work, involved work. John Hopkins University and then uh, Wussel, where we work uh, basically um, on more of on cellular models of this. And then, um, yeah, thank you very much for having me here. Thanks for your attention. Okay, uh, just a couple of questions. <laughs> You can find me by email. I'm sure this was recorded. Even if not, please get back to me and I'm happy to answer questions. Yeah, do we have any questions online? Uh, oh, okay. okay. All right. Well, then, I'm going to go to the seminar. It looks like we just Any information on the Brain Some colleague, um, that member on that campus of, uh, Department of Chemistry, he's asking, is there any information on brain penetration? So currently we are doing a pharmacokinetic PK study. Uh, and I know that this is a very important question because blood brain barrier penetrance is a big issue for brain cancer. So you can find good compound here. If it doesn't go to the brain, game over, or you need to change it. So PK studies are ongoing. We have, um, I don't have a slide here, but compound 41 and 61 have promising um, PK profile for the brain. So I know that at this stage of the, their discovery, at this stage of their molecular design, these molecules can already be used to, you know, for the mice, for the, for the orthotopic brain models. But once they are, chemically medicinal optimized, there's more potential. But as a starting point, yes, we have tested them and there is a potential for the brain use. Thank you, that question was, uh, uh, questions? I have Please a question. Go ahead. Well, it, it seems to me that, you know, the structure of the chromosome domain is not, right? Um, Virtual screening with larger library, I mean, the library of 175,000 compounds is probably, it's okay. Um, and then maybe maybe what we need to do is to find the whole crystal of the compounds 41 with the from mm -hmm. to actually optimize the 41 or 81 
Right. I assume that you're going in that direction, so modify that better, right? So, um, because not knowing exactly where the binding is, how, how it limits you. Right. Um, so absolutely that's the path and that's why we want to crystallize the the protein with the molecule in the complex so we have molecular detail and resolution to to shape it forward i believe it's my uh, expectation that the three molecules uh, might bind to adjacent locations if not the same place looking at these molecules their chemistry they're completely distinct compound 41 is more like an nucleotide analog and maybe that's a good thing, uh, but the other two compounds are very much distinct. So reducing the three compounds into one common chemical space may not be feasible. So I think we may need to just stick to one of those compounds and diversify that into better yeah, compound. Yeah. But I think that's the path we want to take. All right. Thank you, Thank you so much. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs>